Hello, world. This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. What a wonderfully diverse world we live in. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine, and I am Astrid's producer. This week on Solo Travel Talk, Astrid is going to talk about experiencing another culture as a solo traveler. Astrid, how important is is it to you as a solo traveler to get into the culture that you're visiting? My opinion, it is very, very important. And it's important for several reasons. First of all, your, your solo adventure will be so much richer and so much more memorable if you have some level of real cultural understanding, cultural literacy before you go. And also, uh, once you get there, that you you do things that are very unique to the particular culture. I know uh, last year I went around the world, and uh, I did this in 50 days. I went to seven different countries with basically seven different cultures. And uh, at each place, I went to the specific unique museums. Uh, I did a lot of things that dealt with ethnic performances or entertainment. I watched a lot of craft making, uh, went on food tours, which are really good to to get a feel for uh, a culture and why they eat food or these types of foods and different even eating etiquette. It all it all ties together and you'll understand it more if you, do some research, and you have a familiarity before you go. So it's very important that get into the culture when you're traveling because your trip is going to be a lot more memorable and definitely a lot more enriching. The second reason I think it's very important is you you get through what's called culture shock or you you experience culture shock. And a lot of people don't think about don't really think about this because they don't know exactly what it is when it's happening to them. But uh, it's very real. And it it basically happens whenever you go to a new area, especially if the culture is a lot different. The first couple of days, you, you know, you can, can feel homesick, a little out of sort. You might be a little... Uh, revved up or full of anxiety and certain things uh, bother you and they wouldn't have bothered you before so you know you 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 kind of have a disorientation I would say and even spatially or geographically if you're if you're in say uh, uh, Johannesburg South Africa that's a lot different than being in New York City, just the feel of the place. And not so much even with the culture, but it's a feeling. But that goes into uh, part of this culture shock. The different sights, the different sounds, the different smells, the rules, their norms, and the different way people are interacting and behaving. All of this, you have to have a, a, a adjustment period. So, uh, you know, you need to manage this and kind of uh, move through this phase. And another thing, you also have to leave what I could consider your cultural baggage at home or basically your prejudices, your particular political and spiritual views, even your emotional state, things that you think are are culturally correct or your biases, you need to leave those basically or try to to put them out of your, your conscious mind. So you can be open to this new place where you are and this new culture. So I I feel like that that's very important. And then I always try to kind of master what I call master an an otherness, which is, is when you are somewhere and you really start to bond with that place. And this bonding, again, like I said, usually after about three days, 
you you start feeling like uh, it 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 starts feeling actually a little bit more like home or or it, it's not so disorienting basically you you kind of know oh yeah that's where that store is my hotel is right down the road and in that kind of thing so it helps with getting through this culture shock so what you kind of want to do is you you seek to get into the flow and the rhythm of of the place so you can start absorbing everything that's going around you and the different aspects of the culture that really are uh, right there in front of you. And it takes a while to start being able to absorb it more and more. You know, I, I have grown to love to take trips that are at least a week. And I think that's very important. It's a good tip that if you can, don't go somewhere like I just went to Venice uh, in September of last year for 10 days. That was great. And most people only have the luxury of going to Venice for, oh, three days, maybe four days, and they think, oh, that's enough. Let me tell you, it is not enough. Venice is such a fabulous city. It has so many different neighborhoods with different flavors in each neighborhood. And to to be able to really uh, leisurely go through them and go in and out cafes and boutiques and churches. I mean, it's, it's just wonderful. So that is all part of getting through the culture shock, knowing that it's going to happen for the first three days, then you, it'll get a little bit better. And, and you try to get one with basically where you are and, and get some kind of feeling like, oh, yeah, this, you know, it's not home, but I, I'm comfortable. And then another thing about this is that when you go home, you're going to probably go through what I call reverse culture shock. When you get home, you're gonna, it's going to take you a while to get back into the sink uh, of your life. And you'll start thinking about a lot of the things that you experienced. And, and you'll say, oh, well, I, I, I'm going to do this this way now because this is how, like I, I know when I went to Venice, I, I saw all these ladies. A lot of them were older, but you could tell they were Venetian women and, you know, they were probably well-to-do to a certain extent. But they all wore some kind of gold necklace or some type of nice jewelry. It was not anything, you know, real flashy or real expensive, but very high quality. And at lunchtime, they would go out. I'd see them talking with their friends or they're eating, but they had their jewelry on or the necklace on. And I thought, you know, I have some nice necklaces and I don't wear them. So when I came home (laughs) the next week, when I went to a meeting, I wore one of my just plain gold necklaces and I love them but you know that's that's something that kind of happens with reverse culture shock you you come home and you're thinking oh gosh you know why don't they wear then these ladies wear necklaces that's just so feminine and nice and just I like that. It's yeah. a little piece that permeated from from your travels. Yeah, yeah. So, so this this uh, uh, you know reverse what I call reverse culture shock when you get back home, you you know you're kind of aggravated a little bit with your own culture, but then you get through that too. <laughs> Then the third thing is it really just broadens your consciousness of the world. You can read about a place, you can see things on TV, you can Google about them on video, you know, and see uh, and read about them on the web, look at YouTube videos, but until you go to the place and you're in that longitude latitude, you experience the smells and the sounds and the people and how they dress. I mean, you cannot get it unless you go there. So that's another thing about, you know, being culturally prepared and and literate, etc. You have to go somewhere to really absorb it and and what I consider start seeing with new eyes. When this happens to you, it really broadens your whole 
your whole consciousness. You're, you, I, I find that because of my travels and because of being in, immersed in so many different cultures, I'm not as critical. I'm much more compassionate, empathetic. I'm much more interested in why people think differently than I am and is this better. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's wonderful. So those are the three things that I, I think are all important the uh, dealing with culture and being prepared when you travel to experience a new uh, a new culture, etc. A couple of things came up for me while you were talking. I I sort of have a little bit of a philosophical question for you related to the cultural baggage. Do you think that you understand your own culture better after being in a culture that's not your own? For Americans, yes, yes, yes. They might not even realize it when they're traveling. But, you know, America's a melting pot of all kinds of different cultures. And we don't realize that as much because a lot of it is blended. But now we're seeing more and more people are... Are, are going back to their ethnic roots. You know, when you travel, say you go to, to Spain or you go to Mexico, etc., and you get into the culture, you hear their music, you eat the food there. Then when you come back to the United States and you go to a really good Mexican restaurant, you say, that's the real thing. You know, that that's really great. And and I, I'm always so fascinated by New York City. I mean, New York City is a fabulous city with multiculturalism like, I mean, like you, you can't believe it. And it just, it is just gets greater and greater. So, you know, uh, when you go to other areas and you experience your culture and you come back, to to the United States, you you definitely appreciate the multiculturalism. Then I also think it makes you think about too what you actually believe and what you think is right or why you do things a certain way. You know, probably because your parents taught you a certain way. You, you went to, you know, certain schools and, and there were biases here and there, but When you go to, say, China for six weeks like I did and just go to all the different areas, and I did a lot of research before I I went studying the culture, and it's very varied. In the north, it's different than the south, etc. But but when you when you come back you think about oh you know confucius and he was so smart and those people still to a certain extent have that consciousness of you know uh confucian philosophy and it it still has validity in the modern world so you know it really does make you to think about what i believe is that the best way or is there other ways to uh, think about things? So that's what, when you travel and you experience the different cultures, this is naturally, uh, 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 it's a natural phenomenon. And I think it's a good phenomenon. I really do, especially right now with, with the world is trying to globalize peacefully and the problems that we're having. And some of them really, it, some of the problems really do uh, lie in cultural differences. You've heard the phrase that the fish doesn't know it swims in water. Or <laughs> Have you no. heard that? No? no? Okay. Well, let me, I'll switch it up then. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the idea is like our, our culture is so innate in us. We're not, we're not constantly thinking about like, oh, this is what it means to me to be an American. This is what it means. But it's like once you're put into another culture, everything suddenly becomes clear. Like you can see your own culture in a way just because you're, you've been removed from it. The very fact of removing you from your culture, your own culture, allows you to see it in a new and different way. Yes. And, and I, I'll, I'll say one other little thing. I mean, you know, America, besides the multiculturalism, we're all about pop culture. I mean, you know, there's something new coming up and evolving all the time that catches hold and becomes cool or whatever. In, in a lot of cultures all over the world, that doesn't happen. They like, they like traditions. They like to do the same thing, and they're very comfortable with that, that, and they don't want to change. But I have found that when you travel, 
they are interested in what Americans are thinking, and they watch you, and, um, you know, if they have the opportunity, a lot of times they'll talk to you, and they might ask you some questions, et cetera. So even when you're going to another country that's very traditional, they, they're they interested in American culture and pop culture. But bottom line is when you go to these other places and you come back, you see how different a world that uh, Americans grew up in. And unfortunately, we were not really, at least I know in my era, we when, when I was young, of course, you know, we focused on geography and some culture, but not very much. And I think that Americans, uh, uh, unfortunately, don't know enough about culture and, and the world, even the geography, you know, it, and it's important. It's very important. Okay, Astrid, let's get into a couple of aspects of a culture, and you give your take on the approach that the solo traveler can take. Okay, well, there's a lot of different do's and don'ts for uh, different cultures when it comes to language, clothes, gestures, Mm. traditions, etc. But what I think I should do, and I want to kind of go off a little bit on a different take, because that particular subject is so varied so I want to do future podcast on Asian cultural do's and don'ts and leave that to, to region specifics because otherwise we'll be here for hours. And I was going to say, we can't cover culture in just one show. <laughs> no, culture, culture is so broad and so varied in, in even in evolving and becoming more important. No, I think we, we got to break it up in, in a lot of different podcasts. And I think it'll be much more valuable to the listener. So what I'm going to do is basically give you an overview of how you should approach learning and experiencing the different aspects of a culture. And then I'm going to give you my 15 tips on how to develop cultural literacy as a solo traveler. I've done a lot of solo travel, and I love culture. I actually, well, I have a master's degree in international relations, and I wrote my thesis on uh, the culture of the Mezzogiorno. I do love culture. I think culture is the most exciting part of travel. I like to see things and do things, but to immerse yourself in the different cultures, oh, I just think it's just fascinating all the time. It just keeps me wanting to, to go on another trip. So... I think your overall approach when you're you're looking to start developing a cultural consciousness of somewhere else is you should just open yourself up like you are like you were when you're a child you were when you were a child when you went to kindergarten I remember I loved kindergarten I like to go there I like to listen to the teachers sing the new songs learn this I mean when you are in that state of mind uh, you you're just open to everything and you just try to absorb it like a sponge so that is first and foremost when you are traveling somewhere else where there's a different culture when you're reading about it before you go just try to get yourself in a real open mind and and basically don't don't let your cultural baggage think oh no I'm not I'm not going there or I don't I don't want to do that or blah 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 just open yourself up then of course you want to learn a few of the words, some of the phrases, if possible, uh, you know, learn about the way they express themselves here again in body language, gestures, etc. And try to use them when you're there. It's not that important that you do a lot of it, but, you know, uh, try to learn some of that. I, I think that's important. Basically, too, you want to know what's right and wrong. And in certain areas, things that you think are right can get you in trouble. I know you've given in the past episodes, you've given the example in like in Singapore about giving public displays of affection can get you in trouble because that's just not only is that not culturally appropriate, but it's also 
a legal issue. Yes. No, no, no. Absolutely. They, you know, they have a lot of uh, security in Singapore. It's probably, if not the safest place I've ever traveled to, it's in the top two or three. I mean, Singapore is very safe. And one of the reasons why it's very safe is because it's so well regulated with the security systems, either visible or non-visible, and they have a lot of uh, unclosed security that's walking around. So if they see you doing something wrong, they'll it, let you know. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you know, it's important to know what's right and wrong. Then also how to get along with others. You have to kind of know uh, what what will cause you to not get along or or be embarrassed when you go to the Asian world. You never want to show any kind of aggression or maybe lose your temper or start an uh, uh, argument or even to a certain extent how you try to resolve something because losing face is one of the complete no-nos. You never do anything that would cause somebody else to feel like they were wrong or they lost their face. And Two, they don't do that to you. So you, you have you you need to kind of have that that consciousness. And then the last is really how to be happy and what makes you happy. And so you know when you're in another culture, you need to to notice these things because uh, uh, you know when you go to different parts of the world, people certain things make people so happy that you never thought about. And be open to this. So first and foremost, when you, you know, you are uh, thinking about developing cultural literacy and understanding new cultures, just be open, just like a child, okay? Buy tips. I thought this was the best way to deal with cultural literacy and not go off and off and off into, you know, a lots of specific do's and don'ts, et cetera, for uh, cultures all over the world, because that's, that's, that's for a, a lot of future podcasts. Okay, so I have 15 of these suggestions, and uh, I think they're, they're pretty uh, bottom line, and, and I think they're useful. The first one is research, research, and research uh, the culture before you go. And really, the more research you do and the more you kind of understand what you're going to experience, the more you know about a history, the geography, their customs, holidays, politics, religion, uh, cultural norms, etiquette, laws, etc. The more you know that, the better off you are. So start with your Google get on the internet and just start, you know, reading everything you can about a particular country. You can, uh, can go to my website and go to the map and Google a certain uh, destination. And uh, if I haven't blogged about it, uh, I have a site that I'm hooked up to called Mamondo, and it's excellent. It gives you so much information about a place and uh, gives you a good starting point um, you know, as you're, you're gathering your information. So I do that. Then I like the U.S. State Department travel uh, section on their website. They give great information about cultural do's and don'ts and especially things for the women or, or solo traveler, uh, things that are important. Uh, always go to that. I think you are the best advocate for this, the U.S. State Department website. We talk about it a lot. You are like their number one advocate. Oh, I think it's fabulous. Uh, I think it's the most up-to-date, good information. They have a lot of services that you can use. And I'm American, and I pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to get my money's worth. <laughs> But no, the information is great. So um, I definitely am a big proponent uh, about you know checking all of that because they have they they'll save you a lot of. Uh, um, it's, mis- a, it's a it's like a one stopper, the one stop shop. You can get a lot of information at that one place. Yeah, and they'll they'll help you not make mistakes. <laughs> Then also, uh, of course, I still get travel books. I'm older, and I like the books, and I like to get them and outline them. 
as I'm collecting all this information, I put it in a travel journal. And what I do for every trip that I go to, I get a journal and I, once I start doing the research, I put everything in it to include cultural do's and don'ts, important things in history, certain things that I think are key to uh, understanding what I'm getting ready to experience, etc. Et also, if I have time, I might read uh, some uh, famous work of literature by one of the authors. I, I remember before I went to uh, Russia, I read Dr. Zhivago, the, the, lo the, the long Dr. Zhivago. I had seen the movie a couple of times, but I read the book. Oh, my God. I mean, Dr. Zhivago is one of my favorite movies of all times. But to read the book, it just really got me. I mean, <laughs> it is a, but it was a great illustration of the complex passion underneath the, Ru the Russian culture. And in terms of its history and just life, uh, the life in Russia and how it was and how it really still is in many ways today. So if you have time to read some literature and you like to read, that's always a good thing. You know, you'll, it, you'll always get something out of that that you'll tie into your trip. Every time I've done it, I, I have. Like, I'm a big proponent of uh, Edmund Rutherford. He has written a lot of books. They're novels, but they're set in, you know, uh, I think one's Paris, London, the Royal Forest. Uh, I've read several of his. I can't remember all of them because it's been, a, uh, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. But I liked it because it gives you... It adds to the feel of what you're trying or you'll be absorbing in the culture. Then, you know, films. I'm big on YouTube videos. If I want to know more about a culture, I'll, I'll put YouTube vid video, sp the culture of Spain, or cultural do's and do don'ts when traveling to Ma Madrid. You know, so I YouTube to look to see whatever there is in the video form dealing with culture. And I love that because I get a lot of good information and I'm the type of person, if I see it, I remember it better than if I, if I just read it. I'll read it and I'll say, oh, that's good, but I, I'll invariably forget half of it. You reinforce it with a couple different yes. mediums, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I write it down too in the journal because when I do write it in the journal, I read it before I go, I'll read it on the plane, then I read it. <laughs> A couple of times when I'm there, and it kind of I'll, I'll say, "Oh yeah, that yeah, now I get it." And it it's more fun that way, and exciting. You're kind of like you're discovering all these things that you read about. It's it. I have to share this this one thing. I'll never forget. The first time I went to Washington D.C. was in uh, high school, and we went to the all through the different Smithsonian museums and it, w it was over like about a three-day period but you know in an American education we learn about all these different things the industrial revolution you know the the age of the dinosaur uh, you know all the different famous presidents politicians inventors everything you know so all uh, you learn all this is is an American child well, when you go to the Smithsonian Institute or museums, you see it all there. So <laughs> the bottom line was is I learned about it as a child, but when I could really go in the museums and see it and every, it just came to life so much more to me. So that that's kind of what happens. You'll read about it. You know, you'll first be introduced to it. But once you get there and you're immersed in it or you see in a new museum or whatever, it really, you, you have a much better understanding. I highly recommend you writing it down. Bottom line is the more you know before you go somewhere in your pre-trip uh, research, you know, on your cultural literacy uh, preparation, the more fantastic your trip will be and you're less likely to develop culture shock. And that's the next thing uh, on my tips. Be prepared for culture shock. 
you need to go over your list of cultural do's and don'ts and all the cultural information before you leave. So you will be prepared for this shock. And this is going to happen once you get there. And I tell you, it happens even in the United States, if you think about it. You can, you can, I live in Louisiana. And, you know, if I go uh, out west, you know, whether it's Phoenix or L.A. or San Francisco, there's a whole different feel in all of those places. And it is rooted in their culture, in their geography in their economies there, etc. So there's a little bit of a shock, you know, I'm a little bit like a missing home, you know, or I'm a little kind of out of sorts, etc. So, you know, be prepared for culture shock. Know you're going to go through this for the first couple of days. What I always tell people is, you know, you, you know you're going to have a little jet lag. You need to get a couple of nights of good sleep. Because you want to try to ease into a flow of the place. You want to get yourself to where you feel like, oh, you know, I could live here. And what I typically do the first day that, you know, the first full day is I will either walk a lot, just walking, or I'll take like a city tour, a big bus tour. It might not be the most exciting or enriching thing, but it kind of gets me into the place. And I see the different neighborhoods, and then on the big bus tours, they always give you some history, and there's music and and everything. And and I've gotten to where I actually enjoy them. So, um, you know, uh, and also in this these first couple of days, stay connected specifically to to your loved ones, your family, friends. Send them text if you want to do something on social media. Uh, do that, but you know know that you're going to go through the culture shock when you are developing cultural literacy and you're going to another culture. The third thing is suspend all judgments. Try to leave your cultural baggage at home. <laughs> and when I'm, when I'm saying cultural baggage is basically your beliefs, what you think is right and wrong, even your emotional state, uh, you know, uh, different ways of, uh, or different things that people eat or, or how they dress, etc. Don't value anything based on your cultural perspective. Try to completely put that in the back of your mind and be open to what the new things that you're experiencing. And you might not like them at first, and, and, and a lot of times you don't, but you will be surprised after a couple of days, like I said, you'll start accepting it. And it kind of starts feeling comfortable to you. I'll never forget the first time I went to Dubai, which was, I think, about 18 years ago. And uh, I, it was a very long flight over there. And you get to Dubai, like something like 1.30 in the morning, and you walk out of the plane, and it's so hot. I mean, when I tell you it is hot, Ooh, it is inferno hot in the night. So uh, I go through the airport, gorgeous airport. I thought, oh my gosh, this airport is just unbelievably beautiful. And I notice all the women completely shrouded in the black abayas. Now, it, you know, I'm an, I'm an American, and, you know, we, we have... Um, people that shroud themselves either in the hijab or fully whatever and I've seen it before but this was 18 years ago so I, I, I'm in this fabulously modern airport and I see all these women completely shrouded in the black abayas some of them to where you can't even see their face and it was a shock to me I must say it was a shock to me and I didn't I didn't I didn't react to it negatively. It was just a shock to me. So after a couple of days, it was so unusual that I realized I thought it was kind of interesting. I, I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, 
it just it just fits so much in this culture in this place with the ladies shrouded like that and i was thinking i wonder what she's like or it made me think oh that's so you know mysterious or feminine in a way that you don't think and i know that in the western world and a lot of the world there are a lot of preconceived biases and notions but I've had a lot of discussions with uh, women in the Middle East uh, who practice the Muslim faith and in their cultures, and that their perspective is so different than what we think. But the bottom line is, is after a couple of days, I, I, I thought it was kind of, I don't want to say sexy, because <laughs> that's not exactly that's the exact you... <laughs> opposite of what they're going for. <laughs> yes, that's not that's not really what I mean. But I, it just went with the place, and it wasn't off putting. That's really what I meant, you know. So uh, be open, you know. Leave your cultural baggage at home, because um, you know people do things different in different places of the world. And if you lived there, you would probably end up doing them yourself. Right. So, uh, I th- and I think all of that is so interesting. The fourth thing is walk and wander. This is one of my favorite things to do when I travel, is just walk and wander on the streets. It is a great way to start immersing yourself into a place, feeling their culture, you know, stopping in the in the cafes or in the boutiques, just kind of get into the flow of daily life. Don't do too much sightseeing any one day or too much on your list. Just get into the flow or try to get into the flow of the place. Very important because when you do that, you start absorbing a lot more. You see a lot more. And it's, it just becomes a lot more enriching. The food tastes better, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it, you just you you just start having a real positive vibe, and that's too when you know you've gotten over the culture shock. When you start, like you know, you're ready in the morning. I can't wait. I'm going to gonna do this this morning and th- I'm gonna be in this neighborhood. You know when you've gotten over the culture shock when you're ready to go and you're up early and the shops still haven't opened. <laughs> Okay, and then kind of on the same line is the the fifth thing is people watch. Now you have to do this discreetly, and in some cultures it's very rude to for people to notice that you're looking at them. So you you have to practice. Don't to, don't get caught staring. Let's say. Oh no no, because I've a, I've actually got <laughs> caught staring and somebody said oh, that. Oh Astrid. Yeah, isn't that terrible? But I do people watch a lot, but I learn a lot from observation. And uh, I do think it's very important because you will learn what uh, certain gestures mean that you didn't know. Also, you'll start kind of mimicking the behavior of a certain culture. And I'll use an example about chopsticks. I am so bad using chopsticks, and I have traveled so much, and I try so hard to... (laughs) to Eat with chopsticks and eat eat well. And so when I go to an Asian country, I will watch these people eat like you know, and I'll try to play like that. I'm just a, a young Asian kid. I'm hungry. Oh, and it just I'm still so you know. Watch people. Watch what they do, especially the things that are different. So you can try to mimic them or try to you know. Uh, do them their way it, it's really fun it is cool but you're not always successful <laughs> at least I haven't been with the chopsticks okay uh, the sixth thing is use some basic words or phrases of the host country's language if it's not too difficult now in, in China <laughs> it's much more difficult Russia is kind of difficult. I've gotten Basiba, I think that's right, and yet. But, uh, you know, it's hard to, to ask them how much something costs <laughs> or say too much. But you want to try to say hello, please, thank you, yes or no. No is very important. 
Uh, and maybe some nice words like beautiful or this is beautiful or oh yes and know the word for happy or something like that. I know I use the example of Cheerio in a former podcast, but I'll never forget uh, I was in this coffee house in London and I was trying to find the Portobello flea market and I thought I was lost. So I asked a gentleman, we were waiting in line for coffee. I said, if I go straight down the the street, will I get to the Portobello market? And he said, oh yeah, a few more curves and you'll be there. No problem. And so we got our coffee. When he left, he looked at me and he said, cheerio. And I thought, oh, I'm going to use that word sometimes when I think that is appropriate because that is such a happy word. <laughs> and it's so English. You wouldn't, you know, they don't say cheerio in in China. But when you go to England and something's cool or you're getting ready to leave and you like the people, cheerio when you leave or whatever. I think it's great. Okay, so try to, to learn some of the words. And really when you try to use them, for the most part, it is kind of an icebreaker. The the you know the the natives will be they'll they'll have a little bit more of a a, a warmth to you acceptance. Maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if all fails, get one of the great language apps, Google Translate. I mean, they have all these you know apps now that will say the phrase for you. And try to say it. <laughs> Uh, but that's important. Try to at least know a couple of words. So you could, when you come to the hotel, you always say hello or good evening to the doorman and anybody. They like that, and it makes a difference. Those subtle things, uh, I think, make a difference. Next is eat where the locals eat. And uh, this is great. You know, food culture now is so... Uh, popular to understand all the different food cultures all over the world and what I do now uh, you know first and foremost I mean I always have my list of places where I want to go eat but you never know so I go to the concierge I ask them is this good and then I ask them always where do the locals eat where is it really good in this neighborhood around the hotel or whatever huh I have eaten at fabulous local places, and that really can get you into the culture, gives you a feel, too, for how people dine and interact and what they're eating and just the whole flow of it. You know, in certain countries, they eat late. In certain countries, they like just little finger foods at certain times of the day. It, it Like in Vietnam, I didn't realize this, but every day at around 2.30 or 3, everybody kind of just goes and has a great cup of Vietnamese coffee, which is really a, a really unusual uh, cup of coffee. It's a whole different um, recipe for it, and I, I don't have time to go into that right now. But the bottom line is, is it's in their culture people will stop to take this break and they'll go have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea with their friends just to check in just to see how their day is going or to share what's going on with them but that's part of their culture so when you're in vietnam at around that time go have a cup of vietnamese coffee (laughs) so food is very important uh food tours i do food markets you know when you get into the food there's a lot about the culture that reveals itself so that's that's important eat where the locals eat take a lot of photos you know some people don't really like to take photos and then there's some people that are hyper photo takers but i really think now that most people have smartphones uh there's no excuse it's so easy to take photos and The thing that's beautiful about taking photos is you'll capture moments that you can never relive. And when you capture them, you can go back and look at them and the culture becomes even more alive to you. I know, well, I'm a hyper photographer now because I have a website and a blog and I need a lot of photos. And a social media presence. We gotta keep those pictures coming out. (laughs) Yeah, but but I've really learned to just love it. But one of the things so great about it is when you take up pictures, and a lot of pictures, some of the pictures or the photos are not that good, but they capture things that you didn't see when you were there. 
And then when you go back and look at them, it, it reveals something to you that, like I said, you didn't even see about the culture or whatever. It is really, it's a, it's a very good thing to do in terms of absorbing a culture. Because what happens is you'll go there, you'll experience it, but if you capture it in the photos and then from, you know, years to come, you look at it, it becomes even more alive to you. And uh, what happens to me invariably, I'll think, I need to go back there. I had so much fun there. I mean, I'll have fun when I'm there, but when I come back and see the pictures, I'll think, that was so great. (laughs) And maybe when I was there at the moment, I wasn't thinking how great it was. Okay, so take a lot of pictures. You know, I take of sunsets, architecture, people. Now, when you take people, make sure you ask certain people. If you can tell, you know, you shouldn't or it might be offensive, ask. Take pictures of the food, the art in the museums, anything that unique catches your eye. Because capturing the culture through photos is wonderful in terms of your memories and increasing your uh, cultural literacy and also I must say now you can take videos so easy on your phone too I do that too okay then uh, the next one is keep a daily journal now before I leave when I'm doing my research I write everything down you know uh, what I want to do uh, the cultural things that I think are important just everything but when I'm there I go over the cultural do's and don'ts and the different things, make my to-do list, etc. But at night, I will journal. I will go back through my day. I will write down things that I've observed, what I liked, what I didn't like, good things, bad things. I try to write everything down that is coming out of my mind. And it is a great exercise. Not only does it help you connect with the culture more and get through your baggage or uh, release something. It is a really wonderful thing to bond you with a place. And then when you get back home, you've got your own little travel journal that maybe one day you'll write something with. I mean, what happened with me now? I have a website and a travel blog. But I really advocate that because it does help you with absorbing the culture and uh, filtering it through your thoughts, recording it, etc. And, and keeping you focused on what is, is acceptable or not, etc. by writing it down in the journal. Next is dress appropriately for the culture. And a lot of times I always say use common sense, just dress conservatively. You know, when you're going to different cultures, some of them that, you know, still have heavy ethnic dressing, the the people of that country do not expect tourists to dress like them. But they're very offended if you do not dress conservatively. And I mean, basically, just simply uh, with nice clothes on, nothing too stylish, nothing that will stand out, and definitely nothing that's too revealing. That is, uh, going back to Dubai, I remember uh, when I was there, I was with some other Americans at one point, and one of the the ladies had a shirt on that uh, was sleeveless. And I didn't say anything, but I, I was a little concerned. Well, we were going through an area where, in the souks, act, actually, and there were two um, Arabic women or uh, women from the UAE that passed, and they went, and they gave a real bad look to that lady and, and made a gesture to their shoulders is like, that's a no-no. Yeah, don't walk on in our souks like that. So, I mean, you know, uh, just common sense, dress conservatively. But if you want to put on or dress a little bit like the the particular culture, it, it's okay to do that too. I'll never forget when I was in Istanbul, I kept seeing all these harem pants. And they were very inexpensive, but they were really cute. So I bought a couple of pair of harem pants 
<laughs> and walk, walked around and toured with them, and I just was feeling real Turkish. <laughs> but it was nice. But, you know, if you if you buy a pashmina here or there when you're someplace, and a lot of times they have an ethnic quality to them, you know, wear that. That That's in... in the locals see that, and and they it it's you know it's kind of a um it's a nice gesture on your part to do that. A little ingratiation, ingratiating yourself. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just thinking about well, when you're in Paris, dressed like the Parisians. Well, that's a little bit hard to do because <laughs> they are so so they, stylish. Oh, they're yeah. so good. I just love to go to Paris and just that's a place to people watch, especially. You know, how they, just their whole essence. I mean, it's just always very entertaining to me. Okay. Um, Then uh, engage the locals in conversation uh, when it's appropriate. I think you really should try to reach out and do this. You know, what I always do is... If I see somebody that I think is friendly and say, say I'm not quite sure where I am, sometimes that happens to me. I have a pretty good sense of direction, but in some of these places, they have a lot of little streets that wind around and around, and, you know, you can kind of get a little turned around. But if you see someone that you you're, you think is looks uh, like they would be easy to ask, try to, to ask, do you speak English or, you know, uh, how do I get here or whatever and I always look for a woman you know I'm a woman and so I, I first target that's what I was going to ask you right off the oh, bat yeah. as a woman yeah yeah, I typically do that or say uh, you're in a shop and you're looking at something that you're not sure whether it looks good on you or whatever ask somebody do you like this on me or whatever uh, or if you're sitting in a cafe I've had this happen a lot and I love this you know, if you sit there a while and there's some other people that are next to you and uh, they end up saying, well, uh, where are you from or whatever, and uh, th- you can have some really nice uh, times and conversations like that. But by doing that, you get more comfortable with the place. It's just like if you were here uh, at home and, and you're sitting at, say, Starbucks or whatever, and there's somebody there and they're on the computer and, you know, you see that they're, you, you'll, you might say, well, uh, you know, are you writing a blog <laughs> or whatever? So the bottom line is, is try to, try to, to, to converse and, um, learn more about you know what's good to do there a lot of times i'll ask if i'm in a cafe after a while and we end up talking or whatever and say and i'll say well what is really cool to do here and or what is definitely a no-no what is overrated or you know what's the favorite thing about you know living in lisbon that you like and i i i get a lot of good information like that so and, and before I, I go on to the next tip, don't give too much information about yourself. If you're traveling solo, you can be nice and you can ask them. But when they start asking you, you just basically say, well, you know, I have to go meet my husband in a couple of hours. You never say anything that you are alone. Just kind of be businesslike when they start asking about you. Don't say too much. Listeners refer back to the both of the episodes that are all about safety from Solo Travel Talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so don't don't give out really any personal information because it, you never know. Somebody could be very nice, but they don't have nice intentions. Okay. The, the next one is to respect the culture, the religion, and the people of the country you're traveling to. Basically, you know, just practice good etiquette. Just be very respectful. Know that you are in their country and you are a guest. And uh, make sure that you do try to follow all of the cultural do's and don'ts. Don't just walk in the souk uh, with a uh, a sleeveless shirt because it's really hot. Put on a shirt that, you know, goes down to the elbow uh, and, and, you know, tough it out. It's just part of going to another culture and and i I always say you know even when you go somewhere 
you really might not like the culture. You might not get through the culture shock, your biases or whatever, but you have to be respectful to, to the place. Uh, if you're not, then you should, you should leave because uh, they, they have their own way of life. They love it. It's important to them, and um, your thinking is not appropriate. Don't don't you think people would uh, they kind of would I'm I'm thinking people might really pick up on those negative feelings that you might be having. It's, it would be hard to, if you're if you aren't enjoying the culture, if you're not really ready to be in there, it, you'd be it's like you'd be radiating that sort of negative attitude to people and they they're going to pick up on it. Absolutely. And I think that uh that is something that uh and I'm not being self-congratulatory or bragging but that's something I I naturally am not biased or critical I just love to learn about all kinds of different cultures and the way people think and live I'm fascinated by all these differences so I'm never negative. You right. know what I'm saying? But you're curious. I mean, I think that's, it may be if somebody wasn't enjoying themselves, if they took on the oh, yeah. stance of being curious, that might help turn it around. Absolutely. Absolutely. The next one is share your culture with others and do it gracefully. Uh, you know, some people advise do not start any kind of conversation about American values or culture or politics using well in america blah blah blah. say well you know i i like blue cheese and have blue cheese every morning or whatever don't say in america blue cheese you know blah blah blah. (laughs) don't go there because especially right now unfortunately we in this world there's so many cultures that are trying to uh cope with globalization people all over the world are very interested in what americans think but they don't want to be put in a position where they think you're marginalizing their culture so it's very important to share when you have the opportunity, certain things, because they're interested, but do it in a, what I say, graceful and very tactful manner. And that's all part of this cultural literacy. You know, you can go to a different culture and start absorbing it and everything, but there is also the other side of it. As you said, if you're open and they're comfortable with you, they will they will want to ask you questions and they and then then you you start developing a real uh, a friendship and those kinds of things are great. That's all part of the real good part of travel and cultural literacy because you can't get there unless you go through those uh, cu- those steps to get cultural literacy basically. Okay, and then I kind of say, be an ambassador of goodwill and understanding. And that is important. I know people don't think about that very often, but I'm always thinking, well, I don't want to embarrass America. (laughs) And I know that sounds so corny, but I don't want people in this world to think I'm just another, you know, rude American who just traveling all over and they don't get it you know, when they're here or whatever. I don't want to do that. I want people to feel like Americans are uh, nice, they are uh, well-mannered, and uh, we're, we're good, and we're good for all the right reasons. So I really like to be, uh, you know, try to have that essence or presence of uh, a goodwill ambassador. Okay. Uh, Number 14, I only have two more, and I've kind of touched on this, but develop an attitude, an accepting attitude towards all cultures. And this really does take time. And the more you travel, the more you'll be able to accept a lot of different cultures. I mean, I'll never forget 
when I was first in China, some of the incense that I was smelling, it just really kind of hit me hard. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I like this, you know. But the more I, I, I really thought about it and actually kind of told myself now, you might not really like this smell, but they love it. So let's, let's work on liking it. And by the end of the trip, because I didn't keep telling myself, boy, I don't like that smell. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, it's okay. I mean, I, I really kind of associate it too as part of, uh, um, their essence and their their feel and their culture so uh, be opening be open because the the more you're open everything becomes much more interesting your trips become much more uh adventurous and when you leave the biases that you have or you're open things start becoming so cool and and things that you would never think about were cool, and and when you when you come home you'll just it's it's just amazing this process you'll think, oh my gosh you know, I just feel so enriched and more confident and worldly in a real way, not just in a way that you know superficial. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love what you just I love what you just said about the they love it. That is such a great attitude. What a nice little turnaround for something that wasn't appealing to you. I love that. Yes, and and let me tell you. That I, I was going to lead into when you're open to this and you start accepting a lot of things. It's really kind of the substance of what it means to love one another. And this is important. I know people think that that it's trite and, you know, well, duh. But let me tell you something. In this world now, with all the cultures, you know, bashing into each other and trying to, you know, we're all trying to globalize peacefully, et cetera. It's important. Just open yourself up. And when you do... Lots of things that you never thought would be interesting become interesting. Like, I'll give you a couple examples. Well, I love flowers, but, you know, uh, I don't know a whole lot about them. But in Bangkok, when I went around the world last year, oh, Thailand has a tremendous floral culture and flower culture. I mean, there is so much to know and learn about the different flowers and how they use them and how they design with them and what it just blows your mind well I took a tour of the flower market and then we went to a place called the floral cultural museum oh my gosh I that was I, I well first of all the gentleman who uh owned it is a world-renowned floral designer who goes all over the world. He does flower designs for the royal family in Thailand, fashion shoots all over the world. I mean, he's really got a fabulous reputation. But to go there and to experience all the things that he did with flowers, oh, my gosh. I mean, and he's now one of my you know facebook friends and we keep close uh and i hope to go back uh to bangkok and and get into uh uh, more of what he's doing he actually does some flower tours around the world that maybe i'll get the opportunity to take but uh you know i was open to really getting into or experiencing flowers and how flowers interrelate and how meaningful they are uh, to the Thai culture, and they're part of uh, the glue. I know that sounds kind of uh, fantasy-like, but the flowers are given a lot. They're cherished. You know, they they do all kinds of different things with them, and they're beautiful. I mean, almost everybody has some kind of flower hanging thing in their car. 
I mean, the flowers are everywhere in some form or fashion. They have the spirit houses, you know, in, in, in at their businesses or by their houses, and they have all these different kinds of flower designs coming off it. It's just fabulous. Now, if you don't read about that before you go, and you don't take the time to go to the Floral Cultural Museum and the flower market, and every, you will miss half of what all these flowers mean and how, how more than they're just beautiful as plant uh, as plants it, it it's just a it's just so important in their culture loved it loved it so and also develop an empathy uh, what it's like to live there the more you can try to picture yourself if I couldn't leave here and I had to live here how would how would I do this? How would I get into this? Could I be happy? And you'd be surprised. If you stay at a place, and that's going to lead to my next uh, last tip. If you stay in a place long enough, I'm telling you, you'd be surprised how comfortable and how normal you think it is. So I'll wrap it up with my, my last tip. Stay in a place more than just a couple of days. Give yourself enough time. Like I now try to really, wherever I go, stay at least a week, maybe nine to ten days. Uh, I mentioned my Venice trip, which I stayed ten days there. Oh, that really wasn't enough. It was it was a good amount of time to really do a lot of the things I wanted to. But the more time you spend, you will. First of all, you get through that culture shock. And then you can just have the time to wander. You you absorb more every day that you're there. And uh, all those memories in, in your whole travel experience will be, you'll um, internalize it so much more. So that is really, really important. Give yourself time to linger, to converse with the locals, to shop in the boutiques. And, you know, like I, I said, pre, you know, earlier in the show, if you stay there long enough, you'll be so excited to wake up the next day. You'll think, oh, what th- I'm going to do this today. You know, so it, it, if you're only there two or three days, you're rushed, you're pressured, you only see the sights. A lot of times it's just with all these other tourists around. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not the same. So your goal should be to be totally comfortable in a culture and in a place where you're traveling. So that takes time. You've got to give yourself enough time. To me, those are the best vacations. And that's how you really gain cultural literacy of a place. So that, that, that is very um very important and I've traveled so much solo now that I just I love to touch down in a new place I mean it's like I feel even with the little culture shock and I don't go through too much of it now because I'm so used to it I'm just ready to explore I I have thought before in talking about Venice Marco Polo some kind of way had to be in my genetic DNA somewhere in in my family history because I like to just go places where it's just completely new and I don't know for some reason uh and maybe because I have some exper- so much experience at it but too in my personality I just it just is never um off-putting to me it's really more of an adventure so uh, I think that that's important but you have to have enough time to where uh, you can get into the culture so uh, I basically will end with you know uh, when you open yourself up like you said to a place the place opens itself up to you and to do that, you've got to do your preparation. You've got to be open to new sights, new smells, new ways of thinking, etc. But when you do, it, it will be it will change your life so much in ways that you will never uh, realize when it's happening to you. But that is one of the greatest benefits, I think, of traveling solo 
and uh, taking the time to really try to become culturally literate. So with that said, slow down, smell the roses around the world. Well, Astrid, you have a very good podcast, but even this podcast can't cover all of culture in just one show. So listeners, like Astrid mentioned, we're going to be doing other shows that feature different cultural literacy for different areas of the world. We hope that you are encouraged and excited about this aspect of travel and even maybe have some extra thoughts about how to enhance your solo adventures. One thing that you might not be excited about is packing. Packing is one of the top sources of stress Astrid hears about from would-be travelers. That's why Astrid has an amazing packing list that you can get for yourself. Just go to astridtravel.com. You can get the packing list right away. It's complimentary. You can subscribe to this podcast, Solo Travel Talk, on iTunes, SoundCloud, and find it any of the finer places that podcasts can be found. Please rate us, review us, and if you like what you're hearing, share us with a friend. You can, of course, find all of Astrid's information at her website, astridtravel.com. Experiencing another culture is truly one of the joys of traveling, especially when you're solo. So I thank you for listening, and I look forward to being with you next week on our next podcast. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or her solo travel advisors, visit her website, astridtravel.com.